autumn of the year, I passed alone on horseback through a dull and dark, soundless day. The clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, and as evening drew on, I found myself within the view of the melancholy House of Usher. As I looked upon the scene, an insufferable gloom overcame my spirit. Perhaps it's the dreary landscape, the bleak walls of the structure that made it so. The vacant eye-like windows gazed upon me, and with sorrow upon a small lake before the house, adorned with white trunks of decayed trees. What was it, I thought, that so unnerved me about the house of Usher? My horse became unnerved as well, and I reined him in to proceed to the brink of the black and lurid pool before the house. I was there at the request of my boyhood companion, the proprietor of the house, Roderick Usher. Many years had elapsed since our last meeting, and yet a letter had reached me in a distant part of the country seeking my presence. He had said in its text, he had spoken of an acute bodily illness and a mental disorder which oppressed him. He referred to me as his best and only personal friend, and my cheerful society would allow him to regain health. Well, terms of the request allowed no hesitation, so I obeyed, as we shall see, to my everlasting horror. Scanning the house in more detail, I noted its decay. A minute fungi overspread the whole exterior. The stone was discolored. It was of advancing age. No portion of the masonry had fallen, and yet there was a sense of failure that but a breath would complete. A barely perceptible fissure extended from the roof line to the ground in a zigzag direction down, down to the waters of the lake. I was startled by the advance of a servant to take the reins of my mount, and the valet with him escorted me through the Gothic archway and down many dark, intricate passageways to the studio of my home's master. Upon entry, Usher rose from a sofa he'd been sitting on and greeted me with an over-enthusiastic vivaciousness, which I thought was a bit contrived. But as we sat down, I noted the profuse and antique and tattered quality of the furnishings, the numerous books and musical instruments strewn about. Then I turned back to my host. Surely a man has never been so terribly altered between youth and maturity as Roderick Usher. He had a cadaverous complexion, his hair more a web than like human, his eyes so mournful. His speech and manner betrayed an excessive nervous agitation. At length, he described constitutional weakness, which was a family evil. Only the most tasteless food was endurable. He could wear garments that only had a particular texture. He found the fragrance of most flowers oppressive. His eyes were irritated by bright light, and only the sound of stringed instruments brought him any solace. Before long, he described his mental state. A paranoia had gripped him. There was a dread of future events that made him shudder at the most trivial of incidents. He would extrapolate these results beyond all meaningful reason. And as such, he had not left the House of Usher for many years. And I can now say, with the providence of experience behind me, it appeared he'd taken the decayed structure and made it part of himself. His sole companion these many years had been his sister, the Lady Madeline. His last and only relative left upon this earth. He reported she suffered from an advanced disease, which when she passed would leave him the last of the ancient race of ushers. As he spoke, she passed by, wraith-like, through a remote portion of the apartment, and without having noticed my presence, disappeared. Roderick buried his face in his hands and began to weep, and after a time, he described her disease, 
which had baffled the skills of her physicians. She had lost all joie de vie. She had become apathetic and was gradually wasting away, often in a catatonic stare. She was not expected to last long. Well, in the ensuing days, I set about my task to cheer my good fellow Roderick. Madeline's name went unmentioned. We painted, we read together, and I persuaded Roderick to pick up his guitar and play for me. The wild, stringed improvisations only enhance the sense of chaos in the house. remember the many hours that he and I spent together. A closer intimacy admitted me to the recesses of his spirit, and more bitterly did I perceive the futility of my mission. His universe was one of unceasing gloom. One evening I was abruptly informed the Lady Madeline was no more. Roderick advised me that he planned a memorial, including preserving her in one of the many vaults of the house for a week prior to her internment. This was a precaution, he said, as the nature of her disorder might be that she's only feigning death and burial alive stalked many of his fears. At his request, I personally aided Usher in the arrangement for the temporary entombment. The body had been placed in a coffin and he and I bore it to rest in a small, damp, dark chamber through a coppered archway, which I calculated deep inside the house was directly below my bedchamber. The door to this place was massive iron and gave an unusually sharp grating sound as it moved upon the hinges. Addressing Usher's fears, we unscrewed the lid to the coffin and gazed upon the Lady Madeline. The likeness of her brother was remarkable, and sensing my astonishment, Roderick disclosed that they were twins. Notwithstanding her state, she had retained a faint blush upon her bosom and face, suspiciously with a lingering smile that mocked us from the grave. We replaced the lid to the coffin and screwed it down, secured the iron door, and headed upstairs to the less gloomy but still dark apartments of the house. After several days of observing the grief of my companion, it occurred to me that he had abandoned all of his normal occupations since he wandered about the house in an aimless fashion. He had no interest in the things we had done before. One night, seven or eight days after we lay Madeline to rest, I found I could not sleep. A storm was blowing against the house, and I rose and put my clothes on. When a rapping came to the door, opening it, I found my host in a state of hysteria. Have you not seen it? He asked abruptly. I stared back, not knowing what he was talking about. Have you not seen it? But stay, you shall. And he threw open one of the casements at the window and opened the same to the storm. You couldn't see the moon or stars, but a whirlwind invaded our chamber. And there on the lake before us, there was a glow of unnatural light that hovered before us and enveloped the mansion. I turned to my host and said, you must not behold this. And I escorted him to a chair. This is a common phenomenon. It is explainable by scientific means, I said to him. It has its origin in the gases of the decayed vegetation inside the lake. I closed the casement, proposed we distract ourselves with one of his favorite romances titled The Mad Tryst of Sir Lancelot Canning. And I began to read. And Ethelred, fearing the rising of the tempest, uplifted his mace outright, and with blows made quickly room in the plankings of the door for his gauntleted hand. And now pulling therewith sturdily, he cracked and ripped and tore all asunder, that the noise of the dry and hollow sounding wood alarmed and reverberated throughout the forest. At that moment, 
From somewhere inside the house came the very cracking and ripping sound just described. Was it the storm? Was it something more? I continued to read. And Ethelred uplifted his mace and struck upon the head of the dragon, which fell before him and gave up his pesty breath with a shriek so horrid and harsh and withal so piercing that Ethelred had to feign close his ears with his hands against the dreadful noise of it, while the life whereof was never heard before. We heard the noise again. There's no doubt that a low, distant, yet harsh and protracted, unusual screaming and grating sound, much like the dragon gave up when he was struck. Roderick got up, was pacing in a nervous manner back and forth. I continued to read. And now the champion, having escaped the terrible fury of the dragon, removed the carcass out of the way before him and threw down the enchanted shield from there on the wall, down at his feet upon the silver floor with a mighty and terrible ringing sound. No sooner had I read this, there came a clamorous, similar sound, hollow and muffled and reverberating at our feet. Now hear it, he said. I have heard it long, long, many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it. I dare not speak. Go oh, pity me, what a miserable wretch I am. And then turning to me, he said, we have put her living in the tomb. And now tonight, you read Ethelred, breaching the hermit's door and slaying the dragon and his death cry echoed by the clangor of the shield upon the silver tile. These are no more than the rendering of her coffin and the grating of the iron hinges of her prison and the struggles within the coppered archway. Will she not be here anon? Will she not upbraid me for my haste? Have I not heard her footsteps on the stairs? I tell you, she now stands without this door. And at that moment, the door to my bedchamber opened to reveal the Lady Madeline standing before us, enshrouded as we had laid her the week prior. Her robes were all bloody. She obviously struggled. And for a moment there, she just stood trembling and reeling to and fro. And then, with a moaning cry, she fell heavily on the person of her brother. And in violence, and now the final death agonies, bore him down a corpse and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated. Well, from that bedchamber and from that mansion, I fled. The storm still raged on in all its wrath. I found myself crossing the old causeway across the lake. And then suddenly there was a shot of lightning and I turned behind me to look as it struck the fissure in the house of Usher. The crack widened, the wind blew, Suddenly, beyond the house, a blood-red moon rose as the house crumbled into the lake. There was a long, shouting sound like the voice of a thousand waters and the deep, dark lake at my feet closed suddenly and silently over the fragments of the House of Usher. <laughs>